taking this first body out of the ground and uh, you can see on the top of the head there's an entrance bullet hole. So these kind of entrance are called keyhole bullet holes and it means the bullet came from this direction at an angle and then it made the this bone fragment fly off here. And since there's no exit it means the bullet should still be inside the head so we're going to try to find it now. So the face of the skull fell apart so we can uh, look inside the skull and inside there's the bullet that would have caused the hole here. So it's a small caliber pistol bullet, probably something shot from, from very close up. That's why it didn't exit. So that's what killed this man. Hello everybody. Today we're going to speak about bullet trajectories and uh, how they can be interpreted. And we're going to start uh, by using the example of Kurt Günther's helmet. Uh, that I made a video about last year and so lots of people commented about the the location he had been shot from uh, and that's what decided me to make this video to let's say give some basics about uh, trajectories and ballistics so this is Kurt's helmet and as you can see it's been shot uh, on the right side and then there's an exit lower down on the left side so if you look at the helmet from in front and then draw the trajectory you see that it goes from upper right the lower left. And because of that a lot of people commented that he must have been shot by a sniper up in a building since the bullet is coming from on top. And when you know that Kurt Gunter was killed in Paris uh, where there was street fighting and lots of uh, snipers up in buildings, well that kind of makes sense. But does that mean it's true? That's the question. Is that like just a wild guess or is it actually scientific? So let's delve into that question. So Kurt Gunter's helmet has been shot from top to bottom, meaning that the shooter is supposedly above him. So in medicine there's something called the anatomical position, which is the body standing upright with palms forward. And yeah, if Kurt Gunter was in anatomical position when he was shot, well then the shooter must have been above him. But to come to these conclusions, you have to make one huge assumption and a very wrong and rather stupid assumption. That assumption is that in combat soldiers are in anatomical position or have their heads perfectly straight. And is that true? Let's look at a few pictures of soldiers in combat. Are these guys in anatomical position? Not exactly. Of course they're trying to take cover, they're lying down, they're bending down, they're bending their heads. So yeah, some of them have their heads straight, some of them don't. So let's look at, look at these more closely. Let's take the example of the two guys in the back here. Let's assume that they're hit by bullets that are coming perfectly horizontally. See, the first guy here, if he's hit, the bullet will go through his helmet from bottom up. So that means that he was shot from a sniper in a basement, I suspect. And this guy though, he would be shot from top to bottom. So probably shot from a sniper in a building. And as you can see, these interpretations about people being higher or lower are completely, completely wrong. Same for these guys here, handling the mortar. Let's imagine that they're shot from a horizontal position. One guy is going to be shot from really low down underneath, and the other guy will be shot from above, just like Kurt Gunter. Actually, both of them are shot from a horizontal position. And imagine this guy here lying down if he's hit, then people are going to say the bullet was coming from so high he must have been shot from an airplane. This is a very simple drawing but it explains this principle perfectly. See, this guy is shot from a window but because he's bending down in his body there's a horizontal trajectory. And this guy here, he's shot from a horizontal position but because he's bending down to protect himself it looks like he's been shot from bottom to top. So. This really simple drawing is probably the best lesson you can have in this subject. Now I prepared a little test here. We're going to say that red is entrance holes and blue is exit holes. So what do we see on this guy here? He has an entrance here in the shin, an entrance in the stomach, an exit here on the thigh, then an exit in the back, an exit in the shin, and an entrance on the back of the thigh. So that means he must have been shot 
from in front and from behind. Maybe two different people shooting out at him at the same time, you could, you could imagine. But let's look at what these wounds look like um, from the side of the body, if we link them together. Hmm, now it's a bit clearer. You see that two bullets come from the front, and then there's this one bullet that's going really steeply upwards. So maybe he was shot from in front and then fell down and tried to protect himself with his thigh and then was shot again, and that's why it looks like this. See, everything I'm saying here is just interpretations, actually. Like, it's, it's impossible to know what was going on because we don't know what position the guy was in, so we can't know where he was shot from. It's as simple as that. And actually, this example here I'm showing you, this is what I based it on. A soldier shooting like this, and imagine he's shot from a horizontal position, this is what the bullet will do. Go in and out of his shin, in and out of his thigh, in and out of his abdomen, and cause those wounds that we showed. So one single bullet could, call, could cause all those wounds, even though some of them are coming from in front, others from behind, at such different angles. So that's a nice example to show how tricky it is to try to understand what happened in a shooting. And now another interesting comment. When you read um, war memoirs, there's often comments about people being shot in the back, meaning that they were escaping, running away at the time they were shot. For example, this, this guy here is mentioning an American officer that he was with that he didn't like at all. And then it says that he got shot and it says, from the rear we believed. That means that, you know, he was probably trying to get away from the enemy at the time he was shot. This is just an example text, but I've read that so many times in, in so many war stories. So if you're shot from the back, that means that you're a coward and you're escaping. Okay, let's look at this little example with these toy soldiers. The bravest guy here, the one who's leading everybody else, see he's looking back to lead them. So what happens if he gets shot at this moment? Well, he's shot in the back of his helmet, just like, just like a so-called coward would. And same for this guy. See, he's leading his men forward. If he gets shot, it's going to be shot in the back, in the back of the head. And on this picture here, you can see one guy relaxing. And if he gets shot, he's going to get shot in the back of the head as well. He's actually not relaxing. He's guarding these, these prisoners here. So all these interpretations about shot in the front, shot in the back, it's complete nonsense. It's complete nonsense. And other thing is that when people get shot at, they have a tendency to try to turn around to protect themselves, so they end up getting shot in the back when they were actually facing forward just a second before that. Now there is a situation when all this is different. It's if the shooting is recorded and filmed, then things become much clearer because then you can know exactly what position a person was in when he was shot, and then you can deduce where the shooter was from the, tra from the trajectory in the body of the victim. But even then, things are complicated. And this example shows, of course, President Kennedy. Now, I remember watching uh, the movie JFK by Oliver Stone, uh, the scene where uh, they, they mentioned the magic bullet, you know, the one that went through Kennedy first and then through Governor Connolly. And they show how the bullet, you know, uh, turned 90 degrees, came back and stuff. And I was thinking, oh my God, how could the investigators be so stupid and not see that this magic bullet trajectory is impossible. So here the, the, the shooting is filmed, so we know the positions of the people at the time they were hit. But, you see, if you take this magic bullet and just change the angles by a very few little degrees, then all of a sudden everything makes sense and one single bullet can actually cause all the wounds that were seen on Kennedy and Governor Connolly. Now let's get back to the, to the skull that started this video. Um, this uh, soldier that was uh, shot in the head. So I said in the, in the video as I was digging that he was shot by a pistol bullet because it was still in his head. And what that means, you know, pistol bullets can be fired both from pistols or from submachine guns. In a war situation, actually, chances are that it was shot from a submachine gun. That's much more probable. And I said it was fired from short range. What I meant by that is that Pistols or submachine guns are used at short ranges only, I mean a couple of hundred meters. I didn't mean short range as in shot from one meter away. And actually there's no way that anybody can, could, could know such a thing. In fact, since the bullet didn't exit uh, and stayed in the skull, that 
shows it was probably shot from, from quite far off. Now, when people see this, they always assume, oh, there's a bullet in the head, so that means that he was executed, or else he was shot by a sniper. And that is also a completely, completely wrong assumption. In medicine, there's a, what we call the rule of nines. It's the head is 9% of the surface of the body. So what does that mean? It means that if you shoot somebody completely randomly, there's already a 9% chance you're going to hit him in the head. And when you think about soldiers who are in trenches or foxholes with uh, their lower body protected but just the head sticking out, then the chances that a random shot will hit the head are even much greater than 9%. So you don't need a sniper to hit somebody in the head. Uh, random bullets already have high chances of hitting somebody in the head. And then what happens when we look at actual dead bodies, people who are killed, they made a study in World War II. This is in a book called Wound Ballistics that was published by the Surgeon General after World War II. And you see that uh, out of 100 people, uh, out of 100 bodies of killed soldiers, 25% had, had headshots, 30% had chest shots, 15% had mixed chest and abdomen, 11% just the abdomen, and then uh, no arms, and then about 10% for the legs. So some people would look at this and interpret it as meaning, oh look, almost all these guys are shot in the head. This is representations of these percentages we just saw. All these guys shot in the head, they must have been shot by snipers. But that's not the, the correct interpretation at all. The thing is that these guys were hit, most of them probably by poorly aimed bullets or else by shrapnel fragments. And all the guys that got hit in the arms and legs, well, their, their chances of dying were very small. They probably survived. And then all the guys that were hit in the chest or abdomen, well, their chances of survival are quite a bit lower. And then the guys that are hit in the head, well, they're almost certain to die. So what that means is that on the people who actually die, you're going to see a lot, a lot of head injuries. Not because people aimed them in the head but simply because the guys who were not hit in the head did not die. And uh, this is well illustrated uh, by uh, artillery. See, artillery fragments obviously are not aimed, but when you dig on battlefields, you find lots and lots of helmets or soldiers that were hit in the head. And of course, that was not an aimed shot. It's just the fragment had, as we saw, a 9% chance of hitting the head. So very often it did hit the head without anybody particularly aiming for that. Now there's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is when you don't know anything about a topic, uh, you're really confident uh, because you just have basic knowledge and you think that you can draw lots of conclusions from that. And then when you start learning about the topic, then you realize that it's much more complicated than you thought. And then you're kind of like, you know, uh, actually I think I have no idea. And then when you become an expert on a topic, uh, your confidence goes up again, but it remains, you see, inferior to uh, the ignorant person. So for example, you can read an article in the newspaper uh, by a journalist who writes about a different topic every day, and he's gonna be really sure about himself, about what happened. And then when they're, when they're gonna ask an expert, the expert is gonna say, well, you know, it depends on A, and it depends on B, and it depends on C. And since we don't know A and B, well, actually, we can't, we can't know and we can't conclude. So, of course, that's a disappointing thing to hear for a journalist, but that's what the reality is. And uh, on YouTube, of course, uh, lots of people comment that aren't experts. So the reason I made this video is because of this guy commenting on the Kurt Gunter helmet. He said, you see, uh, judging by the impact of the bullet, the shooter was in an elevated position. Uh, look closely at the impact marks on the helmet. The shooter fired from a higher position. No interpretation, just deduction in terms of ballistics. So there's no interpretation in what he's saying, according to him. Actually, of course, he's making the assumption, as we saw, that Kurt was standing straight up with his... Well, he was standing with his head straight at the time he was shot. So if you make that assumption, yeah, he was shot from above. But since that assumption is completely wrong, well, then you can't know where he was shot from. So this YouTube guy is here, he's extremely sure of himself, and I'm somewhere here, and I'm sure that we can't be sure, actually.
So try to be more like these people and try to be less like these people in life. And the biggest sin that anybody working in forensics can do is over-interpretation, you see? Being very sure of yourself when actually you don't have all the information. It's better to say that you're not sure than to say that you are and then send somebody to prison uh, because you don't know your job properly. So I hope you found that interesting and as usual I can be contacted at this email address.